On behalf of the League of Women Voters of East Shore, I welcome you to the 12th Senate District Candidates Debate. My name is Joanne Moore, and I live outside of this district, which is the norm for league debates. We get somebody from outside who doesn't have any biases here in this race. But I'm happy to be here. This is a beautiful facility. The League of Women Voters is a national, state, and local, nonpartisan political organization that welcomes all to join. We're pleased to sponsor debates like this one because we believe in empowering voters and defending democracy. The candidates for the 12th Senate District on your left is Christine Cohen, the Democrat candidate, and Paul Chrissy, the Republican candidate. Each candidate will begin with a one minute opening statement of their qualifications. And the first speaker will be Ms. Cohen because she won the coin toss. So she will get the number one spot. Then we will alternate questions back and forth between the candidates throughout the evening. Now, they'll have their opening statements and then I'll ask the first question that was developed by members of the league in consultation with members of the community. They'll speak for 60 seconds on each question. And then if they want to, they can let me know that they want an extra 30 seconds on that topic. And then they would each get 30 seconds on that topic. Then there will be, a, uh, after a number of questions, there will be a lightning round where they'll each get just 60 seconds to answer with no options for 30 extra seconds. And I'll alert you when that round comes. Ready, candidates? Ready. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I know I can't imagine the, um, how it is to run for office. <laughs> And thank all of you for being here to support them as well. And I, I know that this is a lovely community here, and I know that you're all on good behavior, and I really appreciate that. <laughs> I was a basketball referee, and <laughs> I've got my whistle, so. Um, Any time that you, the audience takes away will be deducted from their time to speak. So. It's important to keep our applause until the end of the debate, and no vocalizations, please, throughout the, throughout the evening. Uh, I appreciate that very much. So without further ado, um, I'm going to ask, for an opening statement, first from Christine Cohen, 60 seconds. Thanks so much and thank you to the League for hosting this. I'm Christine Cohen. I am uh, your proud Senator of the 12th State Senate District. I'm a mother, I'm a spouse, I'm a business owner, I'm a former Guilford Board of Ed member, I am a former PTO member, and I am someone who believes greatly in giving back to my community. I'm a listener and a leader, believing that both skills are integral to achieving results. By serving on five committees, I am able to address the wide breadth of issues that impact the people of this district. I'm the chair of the Environment Committee, vice chair of Commerce, and sit on finance, children, as well as aging. Additionally, I'm the co-chair of two legislative caucuses, one that I created, the Coastal Caucus, as well as the Bioscience Caucus. I want to continue working for the people of our beautiful towns to deliver results and believe I have the experience and qualifications to do just that. Together, we've made so much progress for our state, and through our continued work together, we can do so much more. Thanks. Um, thank you, Ms. Cohen. Mr. Chrissy, one minute. Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming this evening. I did not expect a crowd this size. Um, I, my qualifications are that I'm, uh, and many politicians or people that are trying to be in the political realm say they're not a, they're an outsider. Um, I'm a business consultant. I go in, I meet with people, and for 17 years, I have helped other businesses fix their issues. I'm a multitasker, I'm a critical thinker. 
I'm not, I have not been groomed to be a politician. I have not been in an RTC and I have not been on a board of ed. Um, and I find that to be healthy and, and refreshing because the fact of the matter is, is I think that we've, we've become identity politics these days. I think it's become celebrityism. And I think at some point we got to bring things back to the middle and make it real. These are about kitchen table items. It's not about who's the coolest or who can say things the most eloquently and, and tote anything. They want to be able to make sure that someone's out there to fight for them. That's what I've done for a living. And in 17 years, my business has never been in the red. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chrissy. Um, and I'm going to start with you again, Mr. Chrissy. Uh, you have one minute on this. What are the main issues you plan to focus on that will benefit your district? All of them. I, uh, I find it complicated and confusing when I hear, and it's been since I started, I'll be honest with you, I really thought that I, I had this uh, bundled up, but until you get involved in running for office, everybody wants you to pick three things. That's, that's absurd to me. I want to handle everything. That's my job. My job is to be a servant leader to the community. And when the issues arrive, I'm supposed to handle them, which again goes back to my qualifications. For someone who's a critical thinker, a multitasker, and has a success ratio of helping other businesses and people, that's what we're supposed to do. It's not supposed to be word salad. It's not supposed to be a lot of talk. It's supposed to be about getting your hands dirty. That's something I do. Okay, Ms. Cohen, one minute. Sure, thanks for the question. So one thing that I've been passionate about and have worked on tirelessly, I hear about on the doors all the time, I hear about in emails from constituents, is the cost of healthcare. It's something that we absolutely need to address. As a small business owner, I understand how these rates just continue to rise and we need to do something about it. It's why I've worked hard to pass a public option. It's why we have prescription drug caps on uh, insulin and other drugs. We're working towards um, other prescription measures like importation. That's one thing that's really important to the district. I'm Senate Chair of the Environment Committee. We leave, live in a district that's impacted greatly. We live on, we have several coastal communities in the 12th district as well as many northern communities that are rich in agriculture. I will continue to work on those matters uh, that impact our district the most. We also talk about when, when I'm on the doors, constituents emailing me. I hear all the time about the economy. Small businesses need to thrive. As a small business owner, I will continue my work there. Thank you. Um, thank you. And now to the main question. So I'm going to go back to uh, Ms. Cohen answering first. Would you propose altering the state's tax system to make Connecticut more affordable for people? Thanks so much for the question. So for many, many years, Connecticut's been in a structural deficit. It's because for nearly 40 years, we did not contribute to our pension liability. So we, had, we have long-term pension debt responsibility lies on both sides of the aisle. But for the first time in many, many years, we've been able to pay down those long-term liabilities. And what that means for the taxpayers of the state of Connecticut is about $11 billion in savings over the next 25 years. That is not a small amount. And it enables us, as we go through budget cycles, when there are surpluses with a, ta with a maxed out rainy day fund as well, it enables us to give back to the taxpayers of the state of Connecticut. It. This past budget cycle, I'm really proud to say that we were able to produce over $600 million in tax cuts for the residents of the state of Connecticut, and I hope we can continue in that vein moving forward. Thank you. And Mr. Chrissy, 60 seconds. Respectfully, I'm going to disagree, okay? It's been 40 years since Connecticut's figured out how to be affordable. And I'm sorry, but we can play fuzzy math all you want. At the end of the day, having a rainy day fund is nice, it's very nice. We're 60 some odd billion dollars in debt and we haven't gotten it right yet. And every time I talk to somebody or I hear another politician talk and I don't care Republican or Democrat, you know what I hear? We're hoping, looking forward to, and soon enough and we're going to. Nonsense. It hasn't happened yet because there's too much bureaucracy, there's too much of crisscrossing and who's not paying attention to who. The bottom line is we need a critical thinker we need somebody in there that's going to hold somebody accountable. Look, I've told everybody, and excuse my, uh, my uh, comment here, I'm a pain in the ass, and I don't care if it's a Republican or a Democratic governor. I may only have a two-year term, but I'm going to be up in somebody's grill and make sure that we figure out how that we spend your money properly. 
because that's the problem. Your money has not been spent properly, and we die a death of a thousand cuts. And I've knocked on doors, and I've spoken to people. You know what they said? We can't afford Connecticut anymore. Thank you. Um, Ms. Cohen, you'd like, please hold applause until the end. Um, Ms. Cohen, would you like 30 seconds? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, in terms of fuzzy math, I think the people of Connecticut might beg to differ that paying down $5 billion on, in black and white in our budget in long-term pension liability is not fuzzy math. I would think that the people of the state of Connecticut who received a child tax credit were happy about that. Our low-income earners getting the earned income tax credit raised this past session, huge for our low-income earners, and making sure that our seniors can stay in Connecticut by eliminating the tax on their retirement is not fuzzy math. Okay, and Mr. Christie, 30 seconds. I haven't seconds. heard anybody brag about the money they got. No one is clicking their heels, and those dollars are fuzzy math because we're banking on the fact that this stock market will continue to go the way it does. We're hedging. We're betting your tax dollars. It's not forever, and the windfall that we got from COVID and the, the dollars that we were able to save by people not being on the roads and the municipalities not using their dollars, that is why we're here. This is an anomaly. It's a 100-year storm. It is not the norm. We need to get fiscally responsible and stop toting ourselves as though we really have these dollars. Thank you. And Mr. Chris, I'm going to stick with you for this next question, 60 seconds. How do you view the roles of the state and the private sector? to help improve the state's economy? State's got to get out of the way. Too much regulation, too much taxing. Small business is the backbone of our state. And I said on a shoreli uh, shoreline forum the other day, I said, close your eyes for a minute and imagine Yale New Haven no longer existed. Who are we? What do we have? We're a pass-through state. We are not a state. We have an identity crisis, let's put it that way. We don't know who we are. We have not identified as somebody as something special. We have so much to offer. This is an amazing state. Yet if you remove Yale, it looks like a wasteland. We need to be able to let our small businesses define who they are. We need to get out of their way and allow them to do their jobs. Healthcare costs, double digits. Are we serious? What makes us so special? New York, I think, was at 4%. We got 20%. Who's not doing their job in Hartford? I promise you I'll find out. Um, thank you, Ms. Cohen. Yeah, I obviously as a small business owner, I value our small businesses across the state of Connecticut. I also believe that they are the backbone of our economy and we need to do everything that we can to entice small businesses to open up here. I'm really pleased to say that we've seen the largest number of new business applications that we've seen in many, many years. And we have a net migration, a positive migration of young professionals into the state of Connecticut. I'm also pleased to say that our state's workforce is the lowest it's been since the 1950s. All of this is showing us that we are moving into private partnerships. We are starting to see how the private sector is really providing for our economy. And we, as a state, need to do whatever we can to support that. And we do that by developing workforce development programs, removing regulatory burdens that our small businesses feel, and really listening to what small businesses need here in the state of Connecticut to help them grow and thrive. Um, go ahead, Mr. Chrissy. We have 500, we have 100,000 jobs that have not come back since the Great Recession. Our, our uh, unemployment, you want to talk about hurting small business, wait until they look at the hundreds of millions of dollars that's going to be on their back because we don't have the money for the unemployment. It's nice to be in support of small business. It's another thing to do something for them. We need to start giving small business the support they deserve with a plan, not just a hope and a dream. Okay, Ms. Cohen. Thank you. Uh, we, it is true that the pandemic really uh, exacerbated our unemployment debt. We took a loan from the federal government of $1 billion. And I am proud to say, because of legislators like myself fighting for small business, not one penny of that is going to be on the backs of small business. Right now, that fund, that, that loan from the federal government is down to $100 million. That is huge. We will continue to fight to ensure that small businesses are not bearing this burden. Additionally, I'd like to say that oh. we reformed the unemployment uh, insurance system this past session. Okay, and Mr. Christie wants another 30 seconds. Go ahead. It's only going to take three seconds. 
Okay. Imagine if we didn't have to rely on the federal government and we were actually fiscally responsible and had our own money with a real rainy day fund that was not money that was moved around. Check the books. You can check them yourself. It's online. Ms. Cohen, I, I'll just seconds. respond by we just are in the midst of a global pandemic trying to crawl our way out and uh, all the states received unemployment insurance funds from the federal government. You really want to stay on this topic, okay, Mr. Excuses are reasons for failure, period. I'm good, thanks. Okay, uh, the next question, um, and that's an interesting question in this room. Um, and this will go first to you, Ms. Cohen. 60 seconds. How can state government support more diversity in our workforce, especially in our classrooms? Thanks so much for the question, and it is so important, something that I care deeply about. When I was seated on the Board of Education here in Guilford, it's something we talked about extensively. How do we get more diversity into our classrooms with minority teacher recruitment? We did pass in uh, our most recent session, this last session, we passed a bill that would enhance minority teacher recruitment across the towns of the state of Connecticut. We also have programming, uh, we passed something called the Crown Act so that uh, folks in law enforcement and in other fields can feel free to wear their hair the way they want to wear it and express religious traditions as they see fit. These are all programs that we want to put in place to help minority recruitment into the state of Connecticut. Also workforce development programs. We have a lot of strategies right now in terms of workforce development. We have a workforce council that was implemented through the legislature and by the governor of our state. And through that programming, we're able to get into communities of color and really show them a path uh, into certain sectors. Thanks so much. Thank you. And Mr. Chrissy, same question. By becoming, by trying to become progressive, we have become regressive. We need to pay attention to our state from education to career. We've done a bad job of it. I know we've put everything in the place and it's out there and we've, we've put it on the books. The fact of the matter is, is at Everyone in this state, regardless of race, creed, color, or gender, ends up leaving to go someplace else. We are not making people proud of Connecticut. So how do you get more diversity? By offering more opportunities. Nobody wants a handout, they want a hand up. And people are proud of themselves when they can do good work. We talk a lot about what we're doing and what we're trying to do, but at the end of the day, we have not given people a fair opportunity, whether in the inner city or in the suburbs, we have not done a good job of making people proud of Connecticut and wanting to stay here. And until we put up more time and effort into that, whether it's diversity, whether it's gender, whoever it is, we're not gonna keep people here. The fact of the matter is, is that we can make it diverse, but we have to give people the opportunities, real opportunities. Okay, enough on that question? Yes. This is gonna stay on education though. Uh, how can Connecticut improve academic performance, especially in our urban schools? And uh, parenthetically, do you think school safety needs more attention here in Connecticut? And that goes first to you, Mr. Christie, 60 seconds. There's been a lot that's gone on about education. And I think that one of the things that I'm very passionate about right now, and one thing that I will make uh, a priority is to really clarify. I think one of the biggest problems we have in the state, or we'll call it the district at the moment, is communication. There's a lot of people that hear this and there's this. We have to define what our curriculum looks like, educate our children and put them to the top of the class. We are not, we're not in the country, we're not in the state the best of the best. We need to do a better job of putting that curriculum out there and agreeing on it. That's the biggest problem we have right now is the communication issues that we have and defining exactly what the best curriculum is for our children. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Cohen. Again, as a former Board of Education member, something I'm passionate about uh, being involved in education. I have three children in the Guilford Public School System, and I'm proud of the school system we have in Connecticut. That said, there are strides that we can make to make it even better, and that's pre-K programming uh, and making sure that we have enhanced childcare programs that will help people 
get a head start. We have, we call it the Smart Start Program. Many municipalities across the state of Connecticut are taking advantage of these pre-K programs because we know if we give kids a head start at a young age, they're more likely to have successes, graduate high school, go on to college. Um, in, in terms of college, we have the PACT program, which provides for free community college to students across the state of Connecticut. It's a wildly successful program. We haven't seen the same level of attrition with community colleges that other states have had. As a result, we have 11,000 students enrolled there. Thank you. Um, I'm going to show it. Oh, yes. Go ahead, Mr. Chris. Sorry. Uh, just to touch on the safety issue, um, which is important to me. Uh, we need to do better educating on things like that as well. I think at an early age, children need to understand how we are all going to get along and what to do. We have to address the big pink elephant in the middle of the room. There's clearly an issue that's plagued our country probably since the mid-90s. And we have an issue that, that makes sometimes our schools dangerous. We need to handle bullying and we need to handle children that are having struggles so that they don't do the horrific things that we've seen in the past. Thank you. Ms. Cohen? You know, I think we have to talk about, when it comes to school safety, we have to talk about gun safety legislation. We've done a lot in terms of gun violence protection prevention, excuse me, in the state of Connecticut. I'm proud of what we've accomplished, such as Ethan's Law, Safe Storage Law. Um, we've banned ghost guns. We need to talk about how to make sure these guns are safely stored so they are not gotten, so they don't get into the hands of the wrong people. We do know that many school shootings happen as a result of hands being, uh, of guns being unsecured and those guns getting into the wrong hands. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Chrissy. That's the result. The problem starts way before that. And I know we're very proud, and I'm sure at some point we'll hear about the mental health issues. I just want to know where we've been for the last 20 years, why it took until just recently to actually pass any kind of legislation on mental health. 9-11, okay, the recession, Sandy Hook. And we finally acknowledge that mental health is an issue, and by the way, it's for adults too. We've got a serious issue with this COVID and people being not okay. We need to help everyone. Well, that leads into the next question. Ms. Cohen, you get this one first for one minute. Should this, um, what legislation would you support to meet Connecticut's mental health needs? Well, thanks for that question. Um, also something that's extremely important to me. I grew up the daughter of a mental health provider. Uh, it's always something that was talked about in our household. And uh, we're just seeing that mental health issues are being exacerbated by a global pandemic. So we absolutely need to do something. We've been doing things, uh, you know, passing legislation long before my short tenure in the Connecticut General Assembly. But I'm really proud of our recognition that there there is a widespread issue right now across the state, really across the country, across the globe. Here in the state of Connecticut, we just passed our two top priority bills labeled SB1 and SB2 in, uh, in the Connecticut General Assembly. They're labeled that way because they were the Senate's top priorities. We also passed a huge bill in the House dealing with mental health. All of these will provide extra funding and dollars into our schools, into our communities to address the mental health needs. Does it go far enough? No, we absolutely need to do more, but I'm proud of what we've been able to accomplish. Okay, and Mr. Chrissy, one minute. Respectfully, I don't wanna just talk about doing more. I know about mental health. I've, uh, I've seen it. It's an issue and there are people hurting. And the fact that we can't just, well, we can't just check a box and say we've done something. The issue is following up after, after we pass the law to make sure this is done. And my biggest concern is who's checking the checker and who's making sure these things go into place. There's a lot of laws on the books. Very few get enforced properly. And that's one thing I'll make sure that I keep an eye on. Thank you. Enough on that. Okay, uh, Mr. Christie, this goes to you first, kind of stays in the public health realm. The Public Health Committee passed an aid in dying bill in 2022. Will you support a similar bill if it reaches the Senate this term? Why or why not? 
If I just came down from another planet, I would swear we have a population control issue. We talk a lot about abortion, and now we're talking about aid to death. See, the problem is not, everyone thinks about the person that right now is, is ill, and you, 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 your heartstrings pull, and you, you know you want it there. But that's not the issue, because it was proven in Canada that it, they're entertaining a 22-year-old person, or I think a little younger, that wants to commit suicide because he's depressed. See, what happens is, is we just keep satisfying things with new laws and solutions. I find it disturbing that we keep talking so much and celebrating death. That's what we keep doing. We keep talking about either not allowing life or we talk about how we're going to let somebody go. It sounds to me like if I was a cynical person and a crazy person, I would actually think that we're looking to get rid of the population. That's not the case, of course. But no, I would not support that unless I understood all the facts and only under extreme conditions that made sense. Thank you. Um, Ms. Cohen. I do support aid and dying. Uh, and I would encourage anybody in this room or in the audience to take a look at the public hearing footage uh, for that legislation. It is truly heart wrenching to hear from the spouse whose husband has ALS or the person who was just diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Other debilitating diseases that are progressing at rapid rates that cause immense suffering as people are dying and their loved ones watching helplessly. Mm -hmm. It is truly heart-wrenching. Mm -hmm. um, we had a piece of legislation, not the first time we've had this legislation, um, and unfortunately, it was voted down uh, by a split vote on the Judiciary Committee. I will say the safeguards in place to address the concerns of the disabled community and others in terms of mental health and awareness were great in that bill. Many safeguards in place. Thank you. Um, Mr. Christie, would you like 30 seconds more? My brother had cancer. He thought he was going to die. He wanted to when he was going through his treatment. He's cancer free now. I'm sorry, but unless under extreme conditions, I'm not God and I'm not going to play God. The fact of the matter is, is that we are overstepping our bounds and I'm going to Republican talking about abortion. Abortion was meant to make sure that women had a fair health care. But now we have men talking about, so I would some governors, about having day of birth abortion. The problem is, is we go too far with some of the laws that we are pra that are practical. Thank you. Ms. Cohen, please, please hold applause. Ms. Cohen. I would encourage uh, Mr. Chrissy as well as the audience to read the legislation that was proposed um, so that there's no misunderstanding about in what cases aid and dying would be granted. Um, okay, Mr. Chrissy. I would ask Ms. Cohen to go read a Bible. Enough? I'm set. Thanks. Calm down. It's okay. All right. Um, this question, the next question goes to Ms. Cohen. Um, climate change is no longer a hypothesis. It's evidenced to us in wild forest fires and increasingly strong storms. What efforts would you propose to improve our, to mitigate the change and to improve our resiliency against the change here on the coastline? Thanks for the question. Obviously something that I'm passionate about, I'm Senate Chair of the Environment Committee and have been for the past four years. I've worked hard on resiliency measures uh, as our towns here along the coastline of Connecticut experience more and more flooding at greater frequency. I work hard with our farmers on sustainable farming practices as they are experiencing things like we experienced this past summer, drought conditions, making it very difficult for folks folks to get their food on the table. Without farms, no food, folks. The other thing that I'm working really hard on, and I've been so proud to pass this legislation in this past legislative session, is clean air. Making sure that we are lowering emissions across the state of Connecticut. We are quite literally the tailpipe of the country. All of, we are downwind, or rather upwind of many states. That means that we bear the brunt of many emissions from other places. We need to do what we can to not only encourage the states around us to lower their emissions and put important controls 
place, but for the state of Connecticut to do the same. Thank you. And Mr. Chrissy? I would say that we have to really take a hard look at not being hypocritical. Okay, we can't turn around and talk about CO2 emissions and then support airplanes landing at Tweed Airport. Now, everybody loves convenience. I do too. We can't talk about being concerned about the black and brown communities when their CO2 emissions celebrate buses that then go on fire. We have to make sure that before we do things, it's preparation before application. We have to put things into place that, that work. When you sit and you look at PFAS issues up in Killingworth and, the, and the, the school, schools, not allowed to use the water up there, okay, with high levels and the fire department and the surrounding areas, but there's no press conferences for that. No one's sitting there and stomping their feet, but we have press conferences to celebrate all of the accomplishments, $18 million in buses sidelines without any clue when we're going to do it. And by the way, you can't put those fires out because you got rid of the PFAS. And Hartford also recently had an issue with PFAS, which I thought it was outlawed. Thank you. Ms. Cohen? Thank you so much. So PFAS is a huge issue, uh, one that we need to address. For those who don't know, PFAS stands for per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. Mm -hmm. They are dangerous forever chemicals. They are literally in everything, things that we <coughs> eat, uh, things that we wear. Um, and we are paying a lot of attention to this in the <coughs> Environment Committee. I'm proud of the work we've done. We put a ban on the firefighting foam, causing a serious risk to not only the firefighters, but to our clean water. We've put a ban on PFAS and food packaging. Thank you. Mr. Chrissy. If that's the case, then why does Hartford still have an issue as of last week where they had to clean up? And why do we still have the issues with the contamination in the water? Pretty much probably because we're going to see some lawsuits due to if people are starting to get sick. We need to pound our fist and be angry about all things because we're here to serve the people, not the process and not the politics. So as I mentioned, PFAS is, uh, occurs in a lot of um, things that we use every single day, textiles, uh, equipment that we use to cook with. It is in the AFFF firefighting foam that was used uh, for many, many years and is still used for aviation fires, petroleum-based fires. We hope to take back all of the AFFF. It was part of the agreement through the legislation. Unfortunately, some of it still exists out there. It's a take back program from municipalities, and we'll be working hard as, as things unfold to do what we can with PFAS. Okay, Mr. Chrissy. Again, we're working hard. March 2022, there was a report that came out that said, so the PFAS is at 70, that's a dangerous level. The fire department's at 2,000, the school is over 100. There's a new report coming out this Friday, I have a sneaky suspicion it's not gonna get better because it doesn't go away by itself. Where is the outrage and where is the push to fix that? There are children in schools that are drinking bottled water, but we have not discussed that. We've discussed about PFAS and what it does and all the bad things and how we're gonna hope to do better. Where is the execution at the schools? Okay, Ms. Cohen. Um, I just would like to address that there is outrage. I have tremendous outrage over this, and I have outrage when I propose a bill on PFAS legislation and my Republican colleagues will not stand by me to pass the legislation. So I'm glad to hear- Please hold it, hold it. I'm glad to hear that uh, should my opponent be elected, that there will be a Republican leading the charge on PFAS and environmental contamination. Mr. Chrissy. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for acknowledging I would do that. Okay. Um, let's change the subject a little bit. And this will start with you, Mr. Chrissy, first. Uh, what efforts would you support to improve Connecticut's roads and bridges? Well, again, I think I mentioned earlier, for every dollar we send to Washington, we get back 95 cents. We are dead last in the money that comes back from the federal government to us in order to support our roads, bridges, infrastructure. It's 40 years and we haven't touched it. And then we're gonna talk about that we want electric vehicles by 2030. We haven't fixed the basic infrastructure that's gonna help us to do these things. This is an issue. And again, it needs to be addressed. And almost every one of my answers will go back to how are we paying for it? And that goes down to being more fiscally responsible because if we were, if we had all this money and Ms. 
Cohen um, uh, uh, the other day in an interview turned around and talked about the 25 cent gas tax may or may not have to go away. We're losing a million dollars a day. That's fine. Million dollars a day. Where's all that money going? Because that gas tax has been around for a while. So I just want to know where are the fixed roads and bridges? I haven't seen them. So I would say that we need to do a better job of when we take this money in, figuring out where it's going to go and execute instead of just talking about it. Oh, that's enough. That's mm. enough. Be nice, everybody. Um, what, uh, Ms. Cohen, to you. Thanks so much. So a few years back, we passed, actually before, again, my time in the legislature, we passed the Special Transportation Fund lockbox. That lockbox says that anything that goes into the special, special Transportation Fund needs to stay there. And we need to use those dollars to fix our bridges and roadways across the state of Connecticut. What would I do in terms of transportation? I think connectivity is key. It will bring businesses here. It will bring people here. So we need connectivity through rail through bus lines, getting people to where they need to be. I think we need faster rail service. I think we need to get our Shoreline East train schedule back to where it was pre-COVID levels and make sure that we provide those schedules and the subsidies necessary to get folks on there so that they can be getting to and from work without issue. We've never seen ridership the way we're seeing it right now, offering free bus service. It costs us very little to do that because the subsidy was so high to begin with. If we we can get more people taking public transportation. It's the way to go. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chrissy. Again, we're talking about it, but we ain't seeing it. At some point, it's got to happen. It's been going on for too long, well before my opponent ever stepped into office. We've been sitting here talking about all this money and that lockbox, somebody's got a key to it because it doesn't seem to be translating into dollars or contracts or jobs or fixed roads. We need to fix the roads, which means we need political accountability. Somebody needs to hold people accountable for actually getting the jobs done in the first place. Otherwise, we just got a lockbox full of money that ain't getting spent. Thank you. Ms. Cohen? So Are just uh, for everybody's information, the lockbox for the first time is fully solvent with a $500, a $500 million surplus, which is fantastic news. Obviously, we have a tremendous amount of roadway projects, bridge projects, bridge projects to be done, we need to keep up the momentum because there are rules around the stretch, special transportation fund and we need to keep those rules in place in order to keep the dollars there. But we also need to make sure that revenues in that lockbox are two times that of the debt ratio. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chrissy. I just want to know where those dollars are coming from because again, a windfall some good times, a good stock market. When those dollars aren't coming in there, does that mean you get taxed again on goods, on services, on something? That's the problem. We all have good ideas and we want to keep that money going in that lockbox. I agree. I just want to know where we're getting it from. Are we going to depend on the federal government and hope for the best? Are we going to magically see it appear? No. There has to be some accountability to how these dollars materialize and continue to materialize. Thank you. Good. Okay. Okay, we're changing the topic. Uh, what is your view of the affordable housing issue in the towns in the 12th Senate District? <laughs> Um, this goes to Ms. Cohen for 60 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I think we need more affordable housing. We want to do everything we can to allow our seniors on fixed incomes to be able to stay and live out their days in the state of Connecticut. And we want to entice young people to come to the state of Connecticut to set down their roots and to grow and thrive here. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, we need affordable housing. It is a fact that uh, when the census came out, Brantford was the only town in the 12th district to see an increase uh, in population. I, that's in large part because there was more affordable housing in Brantford, um, but we need to do more. Do I think that 8830G is working for us? Um, you know, that's always the hot button question. I, I'm not sure it is. I think we need to update the law and make sure that we're looking at perhaps naturally occurring housing, look at the different makeups of the towns. But I also know that right now we have a severe detriment, and that is that we do not have enough affordable housing here in the state of Connecticut, and certainly not in the 12th district. Thank you. Mr. Chrissy. We continue to skip the process to get to the result. When we have no infrastructure that can handle it right now. Again, where do we afford this? 
And Hartford has proven for the last 40 years, they've been talking about making Connecticut affordable, and it's not. So the question is, is when do we finally stop, prepare, preparation before application? When do we actually prepare properly so that these houses, because we absolutely are building houses. We just have a, a new uh, project going up uh, on Mono East. They're going, I believe, from 50 some odd units to 70 some odd units. It's a two, it's a two lane road. What infrastructure are we putting in place? See, we're supposed to build the trains and get those lines right for New Haven so that they don't have to get off, go someplace else. My daughter used to come to my house. She didn't want to go to the train station in Brantford because it took too much to then transfer over and it took up too much time. We need to get the infrastructure right first before we invite people in. And by the way, I don't think we're on the short list of young people living in Connecticut. We need to give them a reason to be here. Thank you. I would just say we, we did, I, you know, in, in really good news, we had the largest net positive net migration of young professionals into the state of Connecticut, but they do need places to live and we need to do all that we can to make sure that happens. You know, we also in, in the 12th district, it's 27% of people in the 12th district are asset limited, income constrained and employed. These are working families that are employed and not able to make ends meet. We need to make sure that we have the housing available for them so that they can live here and live here comfortably. Thank you. Mr. Chrissy. Two points. Pandemic doesn't come along all the time. Those young people moved out of New York City to get away. They're now back. They're, uh, they're now people are talking about moving out of the state. And I saw some, some statistics that were quite alarming. Okay, that's an issue. Okay. okay. All right, uh, Mr. Christie, this goes to you first. If the early voting referendum passes, what measures would you support or oppose to establish the new process? Right now, I'm pretty sure we do have early voting. Uh, there's a no excuse um, voting application that you can request. There's, no, there's nothing that puts that. So I would ask the question right out of the gate is, what is the definition of early voting? Is it, um, I have not been aware of what it is, but is it a month before? Is it two months before? Because my opponent and many others took CEP. And sometimes they have to work to get those dollars. And how are they going to have the opportunity to actually campaign properly? And what happens if one day you just decide that that person wasn't the one you voted for, but you put it in? And I know you can go in and change the ballot. Um, but at the end of the day, I'd have to see the rules to be able to get behind it. I want everyone to have access to voting. I want everyone to have an opportunity to vote, but I wanna make sure it's safe. And by the way, the municipalities, how much is it gonna cost, again, the state to put people on to do these very things that we're talking about? Because this is an added expense now for each town to be able to process this and police it. Okay, Ms. Cohen. I think it's important to distinguish between early voting and no excuse absentee voting. Uh, we do have a ballot initiative. It will be on this year's ballot, uh, November 8th, when you go to vote, and it will ask you if you want early voting. This is in-person early voting. What will happen if that ballot initiative passes is that it will come back to the legislature, which uh, brings me to your question, what would we do? What process would I support? I would support public input. To to tell me what they think it should be. What should the number of days be in early voting? Should it be seven days? Should it be 14 days? Should it be five days? Should it be three days? That's something that we have to work out if the initiative passes, mm -hmm. and then we will talk about it. We'll have a public hearing process, and we will really go through a thorough process to make sure it's what the people of the state of Connecticut want. We are one of four states currently that does not have early voting. Thank you very much. Okay, we're at the lightning round now. Just Oof. one minute for these and no 30 second extras. This is, I, I, I didn't write these questions. How, <laughs> how do, um, this goes first to you, Ms. Cohen. Oh, good. <laughs> how do you define democracy? Oh gosh, everybody being able to per, uh, participate and have their voice heard. That's how I define democracy. How about you, Mr. Chrissy? Not what we've seen in the, in the recent years. It's not cool on either side, all right? The idea that we're this divisive and that there's this political discrimination and labeling people we're better than this. I divine, I'd like to see the days where 
politicians argued the issues and we didn't see, I mean, I, I've got people that tell me they can't watch TV anymore because there's 12 commercials back to back and someone said it should be outlawed on football Sunday. Um, I think we need to get to a point that we start, that, it, that the rules get defined, that we do a better job and that we, get, we stop auditioning for Washington. We're a local, uh, local elections and I think we need to start leading by example. Um, and I believe that the divisiveness has to end. Thank you. Um, this goes to you first, Mr. Chrissy. Um, <laughs> do you support no excuse absentee balloting? Why or why not? I thought we just did this. <laughs> um, again, I would have to look at what the rules are, how long, um, what exactly it is, and what kind of cost it is to the, um, to the municipalities. Again, preparation before application. I have no problem with people having the opportunity to vote. I want people to vote. I want as many people to get out and vote as possible. But there has to be rules that are in place to make sure that these things are done properly. Okay, Ms. Cohen? I do support no excuse absentee balloting, uh, and I hope that it is something that will pass. It will be, uh, if it will be voted on by this new legislature in 2023, if it passes, it will become a ballot initiative, just like early voting. Uh, and I hope it does happen because I believe everybody should have an opportunity to vote, and right now, that's not the case. Thank you. This goes to you first, Ms. Cohen. <laughs> Will you accept the outcome of the November 8th election as certified by our Secretary of State? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Chrissy. That's the, pretty much the only way we're gonna maintain democracy, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Chrissy, uh, I think that this is our last question before your closing statement. Please describe a time when you successfully worked with someone who had an opposing viewpoint. Oh, and, That's and pretty wait much. A there is another question, wait, so anyway. <laughs> oh, Sorry. do you want me to tell No, 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 that, go with that one first. <laughs> pretty much every day. Um, I, I could tell you, my mother, um, I grew up in, a, in a, a Democratic family. My mother and father were both Democrats. My mother um, is extremely Democrat. She's very liberal. We argue out the issues all the time. She's a great soundboard. I learn a lot from her. Um, just because you have an opposing view doesn't mean you can't be civilized. And I really, I mean this with all my heart and soul. I got involved in this because I couldn't stand screaming at the TV anymore. Okay, when I was having an issue, a family text message going back and forth, and I said, what did we become? So my efforts, although I will argue the issues vigorously, this is still my neighbor. She still lives one town over. And uh, I told somebody a story. I got into a car. There was a car accident the other day. I jumped out. And I went to try and help somebody. It was a really bad accident. When I opened that door, I reached into the car. I never once thought, do they have the same political views as me? Do they align with my thoughts? No, I was caring about the human being, and I think we need to do more of that. Thank you. I'm Ms. Cohen. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, so I think my record speaks for itself. I have a bipartisan record in the legislature. I work very closely with our delegation members on both sides of the aisle. And one of the things that I love about being Senate Chair of the Environment Committee is it's one of the most bipartisan committees in the legislature. We pass a lot of bipartisan legislation right out of the committee, and it goes on to become really great law here in the state of Connecticut protecting our environment environmental interests. Um, but I will say that we do have our disagreements, and I work very closely with the ranking members of the committee on a regular basis to try and reach compromise and reach agreement. It comes by sitting around the table and listening to their viewpoints and really discussing back and forth how we can meet some common ground. Where can we get reach the middle, and how do we get this over the finish line? And that's what legislating is all about. So uh, I hope that you you hold your legislators to that because it's really important to be able to work through disagreements. Thank you. Okay, this is the last question before <laughs> your closing statement. And it starts with you, Mr. Chrissy. For one minute, is there an issue that you would like to address that we neglected to ask you about? I, um, 
I'm really surprised that this evening that we didn't talk about a lot of the things that are at the kitchen table talk. We have an economy issue. We have a police issue. We have a crime issue. These are not figments of our imagination. They're real. These things are spiking. And when I talk to people and I knock at their doors, they're not asking me about a lot of the questions we spoke about tonight. And respectfully, I answer them. But where are the conversations about our police that aren't just going to turn around and say to you, we're not going to do police work anymore. We're just going to be reactive. They wouldn't do that. That would be foolish. They would lose their jobs. We have an issue with communication in our schools, and it's been very divisive, and I want to see that fixed. And teachers are not going to say I'm uncomfortable with this or that because their pensions are on the line. We need to be able to have better communication, but more importantly is we have to realize the issues that are real in people's lives. They're hurting right now, and it requires critical thinking. It requires doing the job and getting things done during these tough times. Thank you. Ms. Cohen? Yeah, thanks. Well, I touched on it a little bit myself. It wasn't a direct question, but I think we have to talk about our aging population. Uh, our seniors are really important. They make up a very high percentage of our population, and I don't think we're doing enough in the state of Connecticut to address their needs and make sure that they can stay here and live out their lives. We need to do that by providing the exemptions that we've passed uh, in the state legislature on retirement income. I'm really proud out of that. We've just passed some legislation that will allow seniors to age at home, age in place, which is so important to their families. And if they need to go into facilities, we've passed legislation that will address that as well, providing more funding, uh, increasing the minimum of spouse withholding so that the spouse has the resources to live in, in their homes. Um, these are all things that we've worked hard on, but there's still more that can be done to ensure that seniors can can live out their days in the state of Connecticut. Thank you. So we'll go now to our closing statements. And Ms. Cohen, you go first, one minute. Thank you. I'm proud to live in Connecticut, and I'm incredibly proud to serve the 12th State Senate District. Over the past three, four years, we've been through a lot together. But through it all, we've also accomplished a lot together. We passed a historic budget that's fiscally responsible and delivers tremendous tax cuts. We've created new business development and workforce opportunities across the state and seeing a positive net migration of young professionals. We've established health care laws that will save money, provide coverage for important procedures, and expand mental health services. We've taken important measures to protect a woman's right to choose and pass life-saving gun violence prevention measures like Ethan's Law. Some of the most important laws weren't necessarily those that made splashy headlines, but passed by working together to improve our towns right here in the 12th. Millions in funding for resiliency, roadways, walkways, and buildings. I'm a listener and I'm a collaborator who brings my experience and leadership capabilities to the table so that together we can achieve results. Thank you. And Mr. Chrissy. I'm not as well prepared as my... Uh my opponents, so I'm just gonna say this. This political landscape, it's a race. It's a human race. And the fact of the matter is, is that my opponent doesn't necessarily need to be my adversary. Maybe we're just running the same race and it's time to pass the baton on to someone so that they can bring a fresh set of ideas up to Hartford and continue the job of making Connecticut great and working hard to get things done. Sometimes familiarity breeds contempt, and if you spend too much time doing something, you become a fabric of what you are. That's why I'm for term limits. I think enough is enough, and I will tell you that we've made some mistakes. Giving raises to ourselves during these recession times and doing some of the things we've done, and again, I, I put it all the way to the top to our leaders, all the way. Our governor, the person running for governor, we need to lead by example. So I would tell you that uh, maybe this is just us as a community working together, and it's my turn to take the baton. Um, thank you. I'll make my closing remarks, and then you can applaud vigorously <laughs> for these remarkable people. Um, we wish to urge you to visit League Women Voters' um, online voter guide. 
is called vote411.org, and you can find out where your polling place is, you can confirm your voter registration, and you can learn what the candidates have written about themselves so that you can see what they think about each issue. And we also encourage you to amend the Constitution of the states so that the General Assembly can develop a plan for early voting in person. And we thank the Guilford Community Center for the use of this room. We're grateful to the Brantford Community TV for recording this debate, which will be available from BC TV and other area community TV stations and on the League of Women Voters of the East Shore YouTube channel. And from the League of Women Voters of East Shore, we thank Daniel Ehrman and Elise Lowe for organizing all of our debates. We greatly appreciate the League members who have volunteered to make this event possible, and we really thank the citizens for coming out and making this town and region as wonderful as it is. Thank you.